Number one is the fact that the acceleration of digitization of non-intuitive segments of our ecosystem, our economy, our uh, work, trade, is all accelerating at a pace that uh, nobody anticipated even five years ago. So digitization around us is accelerating. Uh, and even in areas that are completely non-intuitive, uh, agriculture, for example, the pace at which uh, digital technology and digitization is happening there is, is tremendous. So therefore, what that does is it throws open more and more opportunities uh, in terms of uh, apps, products, IP, technology, deep tech, solutions, products, devices, etc., etc. So that is number one. Number two is certainly it is clear that old paradigms of compute, old paradigms of communication, old paradigms, legacy models are all being reinvented and re redrawn. The world of the CPU is being replaced by the GPU. The GPU is going to be replaced by more and more AI-specific chips, application-specific AI-specific chips. So therefore, you are seeing today the conventional model of compute, conventional model of communication, conventional model of automotive technology, industrial technologies, all being redrawn as we speak. Uh, so the next decade is certainly a decade where many of the old legacy platforms or legacy architectures are going to be redrawn and reinvented. So that's the second point I want to share with you. And the third is the internet as we know it is we know it is ubiquitous. You know we know it is uh, it is something that everybody uses. India is the largest connected country in the world today with 900 million 90 crore Indians using the internet. But the internet in itself is going to go through a, a dramatic paradigm, structural, architectural evolution in the next two or three years not just with 5G becoming 6G, but the network, underlying network becoming more and more intelligent, more and more autonomous communication between not just two people, but sensor to sensor, machine to machine. And what we saw is the internet as two people trying to communicate, uh, two people trying to share, and two people trying to compute and collaborate over information and data is now increasingly becoming uh, that model is going to get less and less uh, as a percentage of all of the machine to machine and sensor to sensor and all of the compute and, uh, and the analysis that is going to go happen as a consequence of that. Third, that is the fourth. Fourth trend is given all of this, there is a huge demand for talent and uh, talent is today going to be the, is going to determine the success of nations and success of ecosystems and su success of uh, innovation ecosystem. So, India in 2014, when we talked about digital economy, we talked about IT, ITS mostly. Uh, some of you were still in IEEE. I, I, uh, we were certainly the exception to the rule. In 2014, digital economy was four and a half percent of the total GDP. Today, the digital economy is 12 percent of the GDP, and by 26, it will be 20 percent of the GDP. The digital economy today is growing at 2.8 times the regular GDP and is one of the reasons why India is the fastest growing economy in the world is because India is today innovating, India's innovation economy is growing rapidly, therefore our economy is growing rapidly. Now what this means also is that in 2014 we were a consumer of technology, we were a back office to many enterprises but we were a consumer of technology. In the coming decade whether it is semiconductor, whether it's AI, whether it's electronic systems in compute, automotive, industrial, uh, communication, India will be the producer of tech. This is a significant shift in where India's capability is going. Earlier we were consuming tech and doing things around the periphery of technology. We would do things either on core tech that was developed, wireless tech that was developed in Europe, and then you create a layer over it or a stack over it. But increasingly, 5G represents one very important inflection point where for the first time 3GPP is actually incorporating Indian standards as the global standard. And so every one of these future techs, 
tech, whether it's wireless, whether it's the underlying internet, whether it's AI, whether it's chips, whether it's products, electronic product, you will certainly see in coming years more and more Indian IP and original Indian design and value in these uh, systems of the future. So, um, antennas and propagation, I, I did my wave theory and I did all of that in the old days. When I built the first network in Bangalore, in, uh, sorry, in Kerala in 1996-1997, those days there were discussions of intelligent antennas and dynamic antennas to replace the static uh, RF antennas that, uh, that were the norm. It has taken 30 years and now we are seeing some progress in that area. That along with artificial intelligence will certainly make this whole area of RF, in my opinion, in the coming years a very exciting time, exciting place to for all of those who are in the RF and the in that space of communication, telecommunication. I wish you success and uh, I think exciting times are ahead and I wish you all the best. And who will, those of you who have a vote in Tirundavaram, don't forget to vote for the best candidate, uh, which happens to be me. So, uh, thank you. So, yeah, we have a, a few minutes for interaction sessions. Uh, I'll start, uh, sir, uh, uh, our collective dream, as you may also be, you know, trying to accomplish, is to see that uh, India becomes a you know, uh, developed country by 2047. So, uh, I, I'm sure you have laid out your own plans, government has laid out your own, plan, your own plans. But, you know, as technologists, developers and professors or teach, uh, students, uh, like what we should actually be aiming at uh, in seeing the country by 2047. So, different people will have obviously have different roles. But I'll I think what I suggest to those who are in tech, is that the next wave of startups and the next wave of innovations will require people to be deeply knowledgeable. In the consumer internet space and the D2C space, which is where we have seen a lot of the unicorns and success, the deep knowledge of underlying tech is not that important. You need to know coding, you need to know uh, algorithms, uh, you need to be able to work off data sets, and I'm not saying that is easy, but that is a different type of capability. The next wave of startups, and I predict, I said this on 17th of January, the National Startup Day. Next, next wave of startups and innovators are going to be deep tech folks, where the value is going to be not in the how many million users you have or how many million subscribers you have, but with the core intellectual property that you are building, whether it's on antennas, whether it's on propagation, whether it's on compression whether it's on RF, whether it's software defined radio, whatever. Um, or whether it's the next 6G stack. Well, those, the intellectual property is going to be the determinant of value. So either you as an employee of a large organization or employee of a startup or a founder of a startup, those are the areas that you should be looking at. And uh, as far as India is concerned, the Prime Minister has already made it very clear our ambition is to become one of the countries, if not the country, that will shape the future of tech across the span of technology. So uh, that is the vision and uh, he has said also on 21st, uh, 15th, of Jan 15th of August 2022 from the Red Fort that the next decade will be shaped by the youth of India and their capabilities. So if they are good, India becomes developed, if they are not, I, I don't want to say more, if they're not. I have total confidence that they are good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir, for the answer. First of all, uh, as a true and remind, it is my dream and it is my wish and it is my endeavor to see that you win the elections. <laughs> So my question to you is uh, that as a technocrat, uh, what is your vision for Trivandrum? You know, uh, I personally believe that we have been stagnant for the last 15-20 years. So uh, what is a big ticket announcement that you would like to make for Trivandrum? 
So uh, uh, there is a lot of announcements that I'm going to make, and there is a vision document that I'm going to put out. But for this audience, let me tell you that I have very clear views, two very, very fundamental visions. One is to create a, what I call the TRIC, TRIC, T-RIC, which is the Tiruvannam Research and Innovation Cluster, where which will be built around, which will be built around the existing institutions. For the south of India, which is not an easy task considering that we have Bangalore and Chennai, and Bangalore and Chennai and Hyderabad. But given the next wave of innovation that is going to come in deep tech, electronics, communication, automotive, power electronics, all those areas, Tiruvannam can really lead. So I will. And you will see this innovation, uh, this uh, this uh, this uh, document that I will release tomorrow, and it will be online. And we'll be happy to share it with all of you. But knowledge, research, and innovation, and then of course there are areas like tourism, medical tourism, cultural tourism, infrastructure, port like economy, electronics manufacturing, many many things that we want to do that Tirunelveli has the potential to do. So there is a comprehensive framework, and I unlike my Predecessor, I won't say I'll make Tiruvannam or Barcelona or I'll make it a Timbuktu or anything like that. I will say this is what I want to do, and in five years you measure me by this document. If I don't do what I promised to do, then throw me out. So this is going to be my pro forma report card, which I will announce tomorrow. Thank you, sir. I think you have made a very comprehensive, holistic, and. Uh, 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 in depth. So we look forward to seeing that. So Harish Kamath, Harish Kamath, please. Okay. Sir, so, uh, this is about making Trivandrum livable. Uh, what we need is uh, mass rapid transport system, probably a metro or stuff like that, to decongest the city. It's not just about moving the river. The whole bus stand should move across the city. We already have working such, such working models in India. Which need to be replicated here. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Sir. So the answer to the question is, I, I, I have done this many times. Uh, it, it, the approach to a city like Tiruvannamalai and a district like Tiruvannamalai is the, the need for a master plan. Cities don't grow overnight. Cities are like big ships, which if you want to turn left or turn right, it takes it's sluggish. It takes time. There's a lag. So, unless you have a master plan, and Tirundurum has not had a master plan since 1990, there is no master plan. So, nobody knows what the future of Tirundurum looks like. It's all very ad hoc. And the city's future should not be ad hoc. It should not be chaotic. It should not, chaos will never, should never lead the direction of, uh, of progress of a city. So, it has to be planned. So one of the things I am saying, my vision is one of the first things I am going to do is take three months to four months with good 
talented citizens, good urban planners, and make a decadal growth plan, master plan for Tirundurum as a district, not for the city alone, for a district, which will address economic opportunities, in the, uh, will ensure livability, will ensure mobility, will ensure public services, will ensure where investments come, all of that. So uh, uh, that's the way I approach things. I like a plan and, and certainly that's what we will do. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, questions from the students are allowed. Uh, uh, Gopika, you said you have uh, some questions to ask her. So, uh, Hello, sir. Hello. Uh, good evening. Actually, sir, my question is on what, like, uh, for enhancing the R&D industries in Trivandrum, we should go for startups. That's why I got it. But for startups, for tech startups mainly, actually the problem is that uh, for tech startup, we need a business models. Mm -hmm. As we techies, we lack with that business model management and these type of issues. So in India as well, even everywhere that in India, that e-commerce tech, e-commerce uh, e startups grow more as compared to tech startups. I think that problem is with this because we take start, we, we take uh, we take prop tech people lacks this issue. If we have a platform where we can get a team and we can manage that this type of thing, I think. So no, first, of all, me, no, no, first of all, yes. two things. I'll answer two. You know, one is in my vision document there will be a national, or oh, sorry, a global technology summit in Tirundurum every year which will bring together investors and bring academia, research and all that. But you are slightly wrong and I, I want to correct you, I am not, I'm try, not trying to be uh, say on that, but Larry Page and Sergey Brin when they started Google, they were technologists. They did not know business. But they brought somebody in who knew business. Or they learned the business. Today, in for people of your background, engineers of your background, the value of your startup will be in the invention, not in the business plan. So if you do some, for example, some really interesting innovation around 6G, okay, or something around a wireless network that involves optimization of bandwidth, or something, some, I'm, I'm not trying to tell you what to do, and you de develop a codec or you develop something, which is intellectual property. That is the value. You don't need a business plan for that. But you certainly need to know deeply, you need deep knowledge about what is the a telecom company or an internet company or a Cisco or what are they looking for, what is the, what is the gap in their performance, what is the performance bottleneck that they face in high throughput video. And then, and then you are now designing an IP or you're developing an IP to solve that problem. And that automatically means millions and billions of value for whoever is inventing it. In a nutshell, what I'm saying is don't worry about D2C. Don't worry about the consumer internet. That's a different set of people. That is not you. You should worry, you should focus on invention. Original technology, original solutions being designed and invented. That is your background. The moment you are IEEE, you cannot say I start an e-commerce startup. That's certainly, I mean, that will be a waste of your degree. You have to say I have done the next big thing in wireless backhaul, whatever, last mile, whatever. And, and say this is the technology I have invented with a group of my friends in a lab with CDAC or, or one of the colleges here. And to commercialize that and to monetize that, I will now talk to the big companies who will acquire me or use the academic institution that you are associated with. So these are different. Don't say that you need to know business degree to be successful. Not at all. That is the, that is the biggest myth. I don't have a business degree. And I, I did not even know telecommunication before I got into telecom. I was a chip designer. But I certainly read up on uh, telecom technology and I got into technology. I learned business by reading up. I didn't know. Go get an MBA degree. That is a myth that you, because you are an electronics and communication engineer, you will never know the basics about business. At all, you, you have to. You have to know the basics of it. 
Excellent answer. I hope I answered the question. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So, any other questions from student volunteers? You are all ENC students, or? Yeah. Hello, sir. So, so recently, uh, we are keen in developing all the foundry facilities in India. But how are we going to enhance the market facility so that the research ecosystem is already kind of set up? But still, we need consumers or markets to grow up, not only in Eastern India, but we need to be a global suppliers as well. For yes. Um, both in silicon and uh, many other ways, uh, like compound semiconductors, both ways and as Yeah, but the, the government is not setting up the fab. It is commercial people yes. who are setting up the fab. Correct. So they know the business, they know the markets. But how can we as engineers uh, contribute to that so that it becomes a global market? India can be a supplier for them. No, all of these things, India is no longer manufacturing electronics and mm -hmm. semiconductor for itself. Mm -hmm. The entire electronics industry in India today and the semiconductor industry is an export-led industry. Mm -hmm. So today, for example, this mobile phone, Samsung or Apple or whichever phone you're using, 2014, 92% of these phones were imported into India. Today, 100% are manufactured in India. And last year, 1,10,000 crores of Apple iPhones were made in India. Apple and Samsung phones were made in India and exported. So we are no longer import substitution manufacturers. We are export-led manufacturers. So the fabs that are coming up today, Micron in Gujarat is making memory modules and memory chips is 90% uh, for export. The Tata fab that is coming up with uh, power chip PSMC, these are power ICs and power semiconductors that are for domestic consumption as well as for export, automotive, ex it goes into automotive uh, use. Then Renaissance is coming up with uh, a unit in, in Gujarat as well. They are also doing millimeter wave telecommunication chips that will be sold in <coughs> India partly, but mostly exported. Mm. So all of the supply chain today, the value chain that are being created in India, are targeting international global markets as well as Indian mm. manufacturers. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any further questions? We can take a couple more questions. Only before. I'll, I'll also run. I have yeah. also yeah. Sir, uh, now I just want to make a very quick announcement. Uh, so I think the Medical Council has uh, announced uh, uh, technology Visionary of the Decade Award uh, uh, to Sri Raju Chandrasekhar. I will now call up for Dr. Chinmay Sahib, Joseph Apre, and I will come over stage to hand over this uh, uh, award to Sri Raju Chandrasekhar.